People with learning difficulties already have it pretty rough, and most just want to live the most normal lives they can. But what happens when they find it hard to tell a real friend from a truly evil person? Unfortunately, in this upsetting case from the UK, five horrible people did take advantage of a very vulnerable woman. And they went on to do some truly evil things to her. So brace yourselves, okay? Let's dive in. Gemma Hader was a very trusting woman in her mid-20s. She lived in rugby in the UK. Her family had always known that she was a little different from her classmates, and they suspected she was autistic. I knew from a very early age that there was something not right. Gemma was completely, completely different to my other two children and completely different to any other child that I've ever met, and that was obvious from a very early age. But despite repeatedly testing her and trying to get help for Gemma, none of the agencies had ever formally diagnosed her with a learning disability. For this reason, it was super difficult to get real help for Gemma. She often struggled with knowing when to wash and clean herself up. And like I said, she was extremely trusting. Now, she had a pretty happy childhood, but when she got older, she was totally desperate to leave the family home and become more independent. Despite her family's worries about this, they finally agreed to it. It. And she was an adult by then, so they really couldn't stop her anyway. In her mid-20s, Gemma moved away into a small council-owned apartment in a tower block. Her family hoped she was okay, but she would never let them in to visit. Then, on August 9th, 2010, a jogger found Gemma's body by some disused railway tracks. The police investigated as what happened to her looked very strange, and it didn't take very long to narrow down who had hurt her. You see, the flat Gemma had moved into was a place that also rehomed ex-convicts and dealers. Basically, she was living near a lot of people who knew exactly how to spot someone vulnerable and easy to take advantage of. Gemma had no way to understand that they weren't good people. She was just totally pleased to have a group of buddies to hang out with. These so-called friends were Daniel Newstead, Chantal Booth, Joe Bayer, Jessica Lanus, and Duncan Edwards. They'd been convincing Gemma to shoplift for them and buy them things with her benefit money. They had made her keep Class A drugs in her flat, which she'd been told were presents. It's so sketchy, but she only did all that because she was convinced they were her best mates. She wanted to be nice to them, you know? But that gross situation suddenly got even darker. On a Saturday evening, on August 7th, 2010, all six of them had been trying to get into a nightclub. Now, Gemma had playfully joked that Chantel wasn't old enough to get in. This meant they were turned away from the club. Angry, Chantal and Jess hit Gemma and yelled at her, so Gemma went home. The attack began the next day when Gemma went to Chantal's house. She just wanted to pick up her bag, but that was a horrible trick. This is where it all gets really bad, so here goes. Once Gemma was at their apartment, they started to hurt her. They wrapped masking tape around her face and put urine into a beer can and forced Gemma to drink it. She was thrown against a radiator, which broke her nose. Then they hit her with a mop, threw her phone in a toilet, and locked her in a small bathroom. After this disgusting treatment, they led her out of Chantal's place. In the CCTV footage of her last moments, you can see they're all wearing hoodie tops. Gemma is carrying a white bag and rubbing at her nose because it's still bleeding here. Personally, I think it really looks like they knew what they were planning to do next and were trying to hide their faces. It probably wasn't that cold in August, right? They told her they were just walking her home. Very friendly, right? But this was another total lie. Instead, just before they got there, the gang turned in the opposite direction towards a disused railway track. Remember, Jenna went along, probably because she didn't really understand what they were doing or why any of this was happening. As far as she was concerned, they were her friends with no reason to harm her. Jenna would have been like breathing it sigh of relief, you know, only got to get around the corner, only got to get around the corner. Once they were at the railway bank, they went the other way. The sickos put a bin liner on Gemma's head. They stomped on her head and stabbed her in the back. Then for some reason, they also took off all of Gemma's clothes and tried to burn them. Gemma eventually drowned in the blood from her broken nose. I can't even begin to imagine how that felt. I mean, I don't know, the whole thing's just so sad. Her life was just so shit all along. So for, for her to die in such a, it's, it's just everything about it, horrible. In the UK, this kind of thing is known as a mate crime. Now, mate is a British term for friend. 
and the crime itself is defined as when a perpetrator befriends a vulnerable person to then exploit the person financially, physically, or sexually. I mean, what kind of person even does this to someone as vulnerable and sweet as Gemma? The family was heartbroken, and Gemma's niece was totally horrified to learn she'd been to school with some of the teenagers who did this. She really couldn't believe that they were able to do it, although she had always steered clear of Chantal and Jess. But even once they were caught by the cops, the gang didn't even seem to be that sorry. They treated the whole arrest as a big joke, even laughing and being idiots in the courtroom. One of them even looked forward to prison, thinking he would get a PlayStation and a DVD player and laze around all day. In 2011, they were all found guilty of a disability hate crime and were given sentences ranging from 13 to 21 years. That's what life tends to mean in the UK. And honestly, it seems pretty light. They'll probably be let out before they're even 40. The judge even said to them that this case was a chronicle of heartlessness. It's difficult to find the words to express how vile your behavior was. Now, none of it was helped by the fact that Gemma was never formally diagnosed with a disability. If she had been, that would have given her some much needed extra care, like a social worker. She had been seen by a lot of agencies, but for some reason, her issues were never pinned down. Once Gemma was in her mid-20s, the council decided to check again if she needed help living alone. The guy who did the assessment said she was fine to fend for herself, but her family wasn't convinced that the assessor did a very good job. The guy that had supposedly done the assessment at our house consisted of him being in my house for 10 or 15 minutes, and during that time, Gemma actually went outside into the garden to have a cigarette, so he hadn't seen Gemma in all that time. And that was the end. About a year before she passed away, Gemma even wrote to the council services to request some help with cleaning her flat. Remember I said that she had to be reminded to stay clean as she was growing up? Well, this was the state of her flat while she was living on her own. It's not too surprising that she wouldn't ever let her mom go inside. I guess because she wanted to stay independent, but you can see it was in a really awful mess. And quite a lot of other authorities also failed to help her. This kind of attack on vulnerable people is still a really awful problem. Sadly, it was recorded in 2018 that crimes against people with disabilities have risen by 300% in the UK since 2011. Gemma's sister Nikki is still working to prevent this from happening to anyone else. In a vlog she made about five years later, Nikki described confronting some teenagers who were harassing a homeless man with mental health issues. The three guys she spoke to actually seemed to think about what they'd done, so she really hopes she got through to a few of them. I hope so too. The craziest thing is that Gemma's mom believes her daughter would have totally forgiven the monsters that did this. Well, even though they did that to her, I'm quite sure that if she survived it, she'd have forgiven them. Gemma definitely deserved a better life, but nobody should have to go through that at the hands of a bunch of people who were pretty clearly sick and twisted. In the UK, there has been a campaign to stop gangs from exploiting vulnerable people in their homes. In the UK, an independent charity called Crime Stoppers is trying to help. So if you think anything like this is happening in the UK, you can call them up anonymously on 0800-555-111. What do you think about this case? Did the gang get a fair sentence and could anyone have protected Gemma from them? Let me know your thoughts down in the comment section below.